Good morning. Over the last week or two, I've been talking a lot about water in California, whether it's about the drought or the rain totals or the record snowpack that we're seeing. And I realized that it is a very important issue for a wide, wide range of things. California produces a lot of the food that not only the country eats and uses, but the entire world does. So water in California is incredibly important. And there are lots of worries that we're not using it completely sustainably right now, that we're drawing down on the groundwater faster than it's replenishing, and that could cause problems to the entire system and all the millions of people who live here. So definitely an important issue. It's been one of my goals to learn more about it. And I found this great page called, let's see, watereducation.org. The link is in the description if you want to follow along. But I found it it almost has like a little crash course on water in California and it's called California Water 101. So I just figured I'm going to be reading this anyway so I might as well read it live so that we could all learn about California water together and I just happen to learn a lot better and think a lot better if it's out loud. So just thought we'd dive into California water, see what we can learn, just a little detail on the sections we're gonna go into. Looks like there's the introduction, then there's water projects and the California economy, California's water supply, new groundwater rules, California's vast infrastructure, including the state water project and the Central Valley project, where does your water come from, the importance of agriculture, the water and energy connection, the delta, the hub and critical link of California's water system, and a question of balance and sustainability. So. A lot to cover. Luckily, some of these sections are very short. You can see that one's just about a one paragraph. Some of them are a bit longer, so not sure how long it's going to take to get through this, but it should be fairly interesting. So California Water 101. California has been called the most hydrologically altered landmass on the planet, and it is true. I did have somebody in my comments yesterday say that Holland is able to move a lot of water better than California can. So I'm sure that could spark a little debate in the comments. Oh, also I'm keeping an eye on the live chat just in case you want to leave any comments, ask any questions, and not sure if I can answer any of them. Still pretty new to all this California water stuff, but yeah, should it, it is more fun when it's a bit interactive. So today the state bears little resemblance to its former self. Where deserts and grasslands once prevailed, now reservoirs store water to move it to the arid land. Swampy marshes have given way to landfill for urban development. Wetlands have been converted to farmland. California's water resources now support 35 million people and irrigate more than 5.68 million acres of farmland. So right there they're talking about a lot of the changes that California has seen over the years and that's one thing I was reading about in the book Cadillac Desert is that much of the Southwest is supposed to be a desert, but we have been able to alter the landscape and irrigate water and funnel water from all sorts of different places in order to sustain, what's the number, 35 million people, and then irrigate over 5 million acres of farmland. That's pretty incredible right there. As a result of the development of the state's natural resources, especially water, California has emerged as a leading agricultural producer, a major manufacturing center, the most populated state in the country, and the eighth largest economy in the world. Not exactly sure when all of this was written. That's probably something I should have figured out, but I, I believe the most recent one that I heard is that California is actually up to the fifth largest economy in the world at this point. So, and again, big part of the reason for that is the way we've been able to use our water resources to our benefit. However, this intensive development has not been without its consequences. Fish populations have been depleted. Wetlands have been drained. Dams and levees have altered natural water flow patterns. Invasive plants and species are changing ecosystems and altering native habitat. Species of many native plants and wildlife have declined or become extinct. And water quality has been impaired by agriculture, ranching, mining and urban sources. So I imagine that's going to be a theme of this course that we're going through on California water, because 
I started to dive into California water a little bit yesterday, and right off the bat, it seemed like there was a very, there's a debate between the priorities of where our water should go. Right now, this is what I learned yesterday, about 50% of our water goes to the environment, protecting things like wetlands, natural habitats, fish populations. 40% goes to agriculture, and then 10 is urban. Might be rounding a little bit right there, but yeah, there's definitely a big debate about how the water in California should be utilized, and I noticed that in one of my drought videos. That's actually kind of what sparked my interest into California water, was I did a video on the drought, and there was just a debate raging in the comments. This was on TikTok. And so I figured, you know, I'm pretty interested in this stuff too. Seems like everybody else is. Maybe I'll dive into, a dive into it a little bit more. So much of California has a Mediterranean climate, characterized by warm, dry summers and mild winters. It's a big reason our wildfires are as bad as they are. Most of the precipitation falls in the winter as rain and snow. Record snowpack right now. Although the climate is variable, the state receives about 200 million acre feet of precipitation per year on average. So by variable, it means that some years we pick up a lot of rainfall, some years we pick up very little. An acre foot of water equals about 326,000 gallons or enough water to cover an acre of land the size of a football field one foot deep. One acre foot is enough water to feed the annual indoor and outdoor needs of two households. So, a lot of numbers right there. Let's try to just break down what we just learned. So the state receives about 200 million acre feet of precipitation per year on average. And then they go on to say that one acre foot is enough to meet the annual indoor and outdoor needs of two households. So, if my math is correct, 400 million acre feet would be able, 200 million acre feet would be able to cover the annual indoor and outdoor needs of 400 million households. I think I'm doing that math correctly. But then you have to remember that it's not, urban is actually only 10% of our water usage. So, the large majority goes to the environment and agriculture. About 60% of all precipitation evaporates or is transpired by trees and vegetation. What's left is roughly 75 million acre feet per average year that flows into waterways and groundwater aquifers and ultimately becomes available to use in homes as irrigation for farmland by industry and in the environment. All right, so that makes a lot more sense. I thought that 200 million acre feet seem like a very large number, but that, it sounds like that wasn't including what we lose to evaporation and transpiration, which is about 60% of the water that does come in. And then what's left of the 75 million acre feet is kind of split between farmland, industry, and the environment. So there's a catch. Ooh, we're getting a little interesting here. While parts of Northern California receive 100 inches or more of precipitation per year, the state's southern, drier areas receive less precipitation and just a few inches of rain annually in the desert regions. So not only is our rainfall variable on by like the season, where some years we pick up a lot of rainfall, some years we pick up a little rainfall, it's also variable across so it's variable across time, but it's also variable, variable across space. That means 75% of California's available water is in the northern third of the state, north of Sacramento, while 80% of the urban and agricultural water demands are in the southern two-thirds of the state. That's very interesting. 75% of our water falls north of Sacramento, so in the top third, but 80% of the demand is in the bottom two thirds. So that's where a lot of the infrastructure comes in. We have to figure out how to take that water from NorCal and bring it down to SoCal. And I remember that actually, there was always that debate between my grandpa and my mom. My grandpa lived in SoCal, mom in NorCal, and but there is like always the debate between the two, like Dodgers versus Giants. And one of the things my mom from NorCal would bring out would be, Oh, that 
you guys need our water. <laughs> so despite the geographic and hydrologic challenges, California has more irrigated acreage than any other state, thanks to massive water projects that include dams, reservoirs, aqueducts, and canals to deliver water to users, especially in the central and southern portions of the state. Water also has moved east to west, such as through San Francisco's Hetch Hetchy system. And I'm sure there will be some pictures throughout this course as well. So, quick summary of the introduction there. We have a large amount of precipitation and rain and snow that moves into California. Most of it's in the northern part of the state, but the largest demands in the southern part of the state. And then within the water that comes in, 60% of it actually evaporates or transpirates. And then what's left, we split between the environment, agriculture, and urban uses. So let's now check out water projects and the California economy. Not exactly sure what these lines are, but I imagine it's the different pipelines. I think that's what you call them for how we get water different places. So California state, federal, and local water delivery projects to keep the water flowing to cities, farms, and industry. And there's no key on the map, but I imagine they're splitting up the different colors based on state, federal, and local. So water fuels the economy of California and managing it properly is of paramount importance. The resource also has been a source of decades long political wars, but that's, that's pretty much what the book Cadillac Desert is about. I read about half of it and then got sidetracked, but it is an incredible book going into all of the different politics and corruption around water in California. You would be surprised at what an interesting topic it actually is. So besides satisfying the needs of a growing population, demands for more water also come from the agricultural industry, businesses, manufacturers, and developers. These needs must be balanced against demands for protecting water quality and for protecting fisheries, wildlife, and recreational interests. So again, it's that balance between urban, industry, agriculture, and then for a lot of the things that make California as beautiful and as amazing as it is. We have, seems like we have very clean environment, some good forests, very great recreation, beautiful parks, and it's not, we didn't just fall into that. It's because we actively balance our different priorities. And then what the correct priority is, is that that's Hopefully what we'll start to figure out throughout this course, but I'm sure that's a, that's a topic for a lifelong pursuit to try to figure out. So the fundamental controversy is one of distribution. As conflicts between these competing interests continue to be exacerbated by continued population growth and periods of drought. So it's already kind of a testy situation we're in with the different priorities. And then you can imagine how much harder that, that gets when you, your population keeps growing, which brings more demand in, and then you're also having years of drought, which is luckily something that has improved greatly over the last, uh, last year. And actually, I could bring that up. Let's check out the California Drought Monitor real quick, just to get an update on how our water is doing at this point. Check out that map. It looks amazing. So. I love looking into the data table down here. Start of water year, 94% of the state was in that severe drought category. Now, 2% of the state is. The severe drought is the bright orange. And you can see a few little traces of that severe drought left. And much of, the, of central California, where it seems like a lot of those atmospheric rivers were centered, is completely out of any drought category whatsoever, not, not even abnormally dry. And last week was the first time in a long time where the majority of the state is now not even in the abnormally dry category. So all the rain and snow that we've picked up this year has been amazing in terms of the California drought. So everything depends on the development and management of water, capturing it behind dams, storing it in reservoirs, and rerouting it in canals stretching hundreds of miles across the state. California has 1,400 dams. Oh wow, 1,400 dams, that is wild. 
two of the largest water storage and transport systems in the world, the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project, and some of the largest reservoirs in the country. And hopefully it dives into the Central, water, Central Valley Project and State Water Project more because I see that come up a lot, but I don't actually know what it means. Let's see, yeah, it looks like there's a section on it in about three sections, we'll be able to see that. So that shows wild and scenic river map. So yet leaving water in rivers and streams is important for the health of the environment, wildlife and fish. Some water is officially dedicated to the environment, such as Bay Delta outflows. And one fact that I read yesterday is 90% of the water that we have to work with actually flows out to the ocean. And then what's left, I think we just learned that 60% of it evaporates and then transpirates. So we're actually not working with as much water as actually moves into California. So other waterways are protected under the state and or federal Wild and Scenic Rivers Acts, putting further water development off limits. Overall, so that must be why the system is somewhat stressed right now is because we have limits on further development, but then our population keeps growing. So then we're trying to figure out how to distribute the same amount of water that was coming in before with a much larger demand. Although doing a lot better now that we've picked up so much rain and snow over this last year, refilled a lot of our reservoirs, record snowpack in the central and southern Sierra, which will melt over the next few months and continue to feed our reservoirs, bring some moisture into our fuels and help us hopefully make it through another year without going into another drought again. So overall, how much water is left in streams and rivers for the environment depends on a lot, depends a lot on yearly precipitation. Drought years such as 2014 left many streams depleted and cities and farmers facing water supply cutbacks and in some places, water rationing. About 62% of California's water goes to agriculture, 16% to urban use, and 22% is dedicated to in-stream flows and to maintain drinking water quality, according to the California Water Blog and former University of California Davis professor Jeff Mount, based on net water use, which accounts for water that is lost to evapotranspiration or salt sinks, and not return to rivers or groundwater. I think that was all one sentence. Wow. So again, I, I'm not exactly sure when this course was written on California Water 101, but I did do a lot of research yesterday and I saw some slightly different numbers there. I saw that 50% goes to the environment, 40% goes to agriculture, and 10% is for urban there's most likely some different classifications that are going on between those. So you can look into both of those numbers to see which ones you believe. So continuing here, nice little shot of the interactive map of the hydrology of the Central Valley. You can see how a lot of the rain falls up in the upper elevations. Big part of that's because of the rain shadow effect. Get a lot of snow up there that ends up melting. And then it goes into these different rivers, and then feeds our reservoirs, and then eventually it looks like it ends up in San Francisco Bay. California has 10 major drainage basins, also known as the state's hydrologic regions. From north to south, the basins are North Coast, Sacramento River, North La Honten, San Francisco Bay, San Joaquin River, Central Coast, Tulare Lake, South La Honten, South Coast, and Colorado River. Amazingly, with the hundreds of rivers and streams, plus more than 1,500 lakes and reservoirs in California, the state's groundwater storage capacity is more than 10 times that of all its surface waterways. I personally, I, I don't think that's very surprising because if you think about what's on the surface is a lot of what's been falling over the last year or maybe the last few years, whereas groundwater has been building up for thousands of years. And that's also why it's a big concern that we're depleting it as quickly as we are, because it takes a lot longer to build up that groundwater than how much rain we're picking up right now. So if you 
take out too much, then you end up depleting it, and it becomes an unsustainable practice. And I'm, I'm sure it gets into that throughout this course. So, continuing, water pumped from wells in a typical year quenches 40% of California's freshwater needs. According to the State Water Plan Update, published by the California Department of Water Resources every four years. So, 40% of California's fresh water comes from wells. The number increases to 60% or more in dry years. In any year, groundwater use varies by region. Some areas of California are much more dependent on groundwater than others. I'd imagine the places more dependent on groundwater would be more Southern California, Although they might have less groundwater because they haven't been picking up as much rainfall. There was one other interesting thing here. The fact that it increases in dry years. That makes perfect sense. If you have less surface water coming in, you're going to need to rely more on your groundwater. Many rural areas depend entirely on groundwater, as do larger cities such as Bakersfield and Fresno. That's a pretty wild sentence right there. Along the central coast, 90% of all drinking water is from groundwater. Huh. I, that's a big surprise to me. I, I thought our drinking water came from reservoirs on the central coast. However, other cities such as San Francisco and San Diego have very little groundwater resources. Not sure I'd want to drink San Francisco groundwater anyway. In all, 85% of Californians depend on groundwater for at least part of their drinking water, according to the California State Water Resources Control Board. Continuing, California uses more groundwater than any other state. Not a big surprise, considering we have the largest population and we have the largest agricultural industry. And when reservoirs run low, farmers and cities pump even more water from underground. While there are programs throughout the state to recharge groundwater basins, in many parts of the state, no efforts are made to put water back into the ground. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Overall, California pumps out up to 2 million more acre feet a year than is recharged, according to state estimates. That's, that's a pretty alarming sen sentence right there. Overall, California pumps out 2 million more acre feet a year than is recharged, which means there's no way that we would be able to continue the current practice forever. We would eventually run out of water. Now, again, I, I don't know all the answers here. That's, that's part of why I'm reading this course, just to try to figure out what's going on with California water. So I'm, I, I honestly don't really have much opinion yet on California water just because I know so little about it. That's why I'm trying to fill in some of my ignorance here. But yeah, it's just that contrast between the different priorities. Like if we need food and people need water, it's very difficult not to rely on that groundwater, even if we are using it unsustainably. And then you could maybe make the argument that with increases in technology and human progress, by the time we're affected by the water problem, maybe we've figured out some new strategy to very efficiently get water from some other way, almost like how we solved the farming crisis once we figured out how to fixate nitrogen. There's, there's always the debate of whether you want to rely on human progress or solve some of the problems you have right now. Again, I, I don't have all the answers. Surface water and groundwater are connected in a system of watersheds and groundwater basins. State Water Plan notes surface water and groundwater are a single resource. In California, winter precipitation and spring snowmelt are captured in surface water reservoirs to provide both flood protection and water supply to the state. Reservoir storage also factors into drought assessment. The state's largest surface reservoir is the Sierra Nevada snowpack, about 15 million acre feet on average, the state water plant states. It's actually pretty cool when you think about that, that our largest reservoir of water is actually snow that's just sitting out in the open and then as it melts over the spring into the summer months, it slowly filters into our reservoirs and then we're able to use it. It's almost like 
a forced savings account, which is pretty cool. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to find the graphic I'm looking for right off the bat. So if I don't, I'm gonna move on. But let's see California snowpack. There's one amazing, oh, this is exactly what I'm looking for right here, CDEC. So this is how this California snowpack is doing this year. Northern Sierra's picked up 190% of normal, which means that's pretty much twice as much snow as we normally get in a given year. Central Sierra, 233%, and the Southern Sierra has picked up three times, I'll make this a little bigger for you, has picked up three times as much snow as we see in a normal year. And that's a record at this point in the year. It's not the largest snowpack of all time yet, but at by March 31st, it's the largest snowpack we've ever seen in the central and southern Sierra. So that's certainly going to help us out, buy us a little time when it comes to the dangers and problems when it comes to California water. So new groundwater rules. Let's learn about some rules. First, I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. Ah, kind of ironic. Um, I don't know if that's irony, but new groundwater rules. I imagine the red is all the different rules we have. Or click here to see an interactive map of groundwater basins and sub-basins. Oh, so that's what those red things are. California's groundwater has gone unregulated at the state level for decades. In fact, the state was one of the last to enact any laws pertaining to how this resource can be pumped and used. However, a new era of groundwater management began September 17, 2014, after Governor Jerry Brown signing of historic leg legislation, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act which empowers local officials to halt the trend of critically overdraft basins. So this ties into what we were reading earlier. Where's that scary fact that we found? Um, we're looking for the number. Oh, it was in one of these previous sections. Let's see if we can find it. It had two million in it. There it is. California pumps out up to 2 million more acre feet a year than is recharged according to state estimates. So that's not sustainable. So that's where we've started to bring in some rules. And it looks like it was very recently that we started to regulate on a state level, which I would say is actually pretty surprising. It was only in 2014 that we started to regulate groundwater management. The law, which went into effect in 2015, sets a timeline to identify responsible local agencies, which will work as a team, the means to reverse overdrafted conditions in certain areas, and to ensure the 127 high and medium priority groundwater basins or sub-basins not in overdraft reach sustainability by 2040. Whether Sigma will release its full transformative potential remains to be seen. So that's that's interesting. So what we were talking about is how if we're taking out more from our groundwater than is being replenished, it's unsustainable and that means it would run out eventually. But it does look like we've put in some regulation in place to try to reach sustainability by 2040. Continuing to the next section, California's vast infrastructure state water project and central valley project this is something i was really interested in because i've heard a lot about this and i honestly have no idea what it means so we'll we'll, we'll probably be able to answer at least some of our questions pretty soon here california first this picture pretty cool picture california aqueduct is 400 miles long it starts in the delta and conveys water to southern california i love to know if any engineers watch this video you might be able to comment is there any way to cover our different aqueducts because i imagine we're losing a lot of water due to evaporation while it's being transported although i imagine it they must have just done a cost benefit analysis and it must not be worth it to cover it but yeah depending on how expensive california water gets i imagine if we'll 
re-evaluate that cost-benefit analysis. California's major urban centers, Southern California and the Bay Area, go Giants, lack sufficient groundwater and other local resources to support their large populations, so water must be imported from other portions of the state. That makes perfect sense. There's so many people living in a concentrated area that there's, and especially in LA and Southern California where they don't pick up all that much rain, there's no way they would be able to sustain that population unless we had some very advanced infrastructure. The San Francisco Bay Area imports more than 65% of its water through the Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct and East Bay's Mo. Oh, there's no way I say this right. Mokulumne? Mokulumne Aqueduct. The region also obtains water from the SWP and the federal CVP. Is SV, SWP? Yeah, that's the State Water Project, and CVP is the Central Valley Project. Looks like we're using acronyms. So, Contra Costa County obtains its supplies directly from the Delta. In addition to Hetch Hetchy, the SoCal Water Projects, I think that's what it is, right? The State Water Project. State Water Project, I gotta figure this out. State Water Project, Central Valley Project. I can remember that. The State Water Projects, in addition to Hetch Hetchy, the State Water Project's South Bay Aqueduct supplies water to Alameda and Santa Clara counties. Groundwater is another major source of supply for the Santa Clara area, which also receives water from both projects. Southern California imports more than half of its water supply through the Los Angeles Aqueduct, the Colorado River Aqueduct, and the State Water Project. And more than half of their water comes from these three different sources. One of the state's earliest major water projects, the Los Angeles Aqueduct, supplies water and electricity th to 3.8 million residents in the city of Los Angeles. Interesting, it supplies water and electricity. So I wonder if where we got the water is from some dam that is also hydro, that also engages in hydropower where the falling water spins some turbines and generates electricity. Pretty sure that's how that works. So yeah, that's pretty interesting. Serving as a wholesale entity for most of the Southern California region, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California imports water from the Colorado River and the State Water Project and supplies it to member agencies and cities. Many Southern California cities also rely on groundwater, especially those along the coast. This is the second time they've mentioned the Colorado River. And I'm going to be honest, I don't exactly know the exact map of the Colorado River. So let's, let's check it out. Some images. Oh, here's a good one. Zooming in, looks like it makes sense, starts in Colorado, goes through Utah, goes through Arizona, looks like it's on the border of Nevada, and then it looks like it's not actually, it's right on the border of California and Arizona. Huh, never knew that's where those borders came from. And it sounds like we take a lot of that Colorado River and bring it into Southern California. I imagine there's a lot of politics involved in that about how do you decide how much water can be taken out of the Colorado River because people upstream would have, it's kind of the tragedy of the commons, people upstream would have incentive just to take as much as possible, irrigate as much land as possible up here, and then leave nothing for, for people lower in the Colorado River. So I imagine there's lots of different rules and regulations regarding that. California's vast agriculture industry also depends on large water projects. The Central Valley Project supplies water primarily for irrigation within the Central Valley, and Kern County relies on the State Water Project for its water. The Imperial, the, the Imperial Irrigation District manages the system, which delivers Colorado River water to the Imperial Valley. Los Angeles Aqueduct. I think this is something I learned about in the Cadillac Desert, and I think it was a pretty controversial situation of how we got the Los Angeles Aqueduct, if I'm remembering the same thing. Wonder if it gets into it here. The Los Angeles Aqueduct, owned and operated by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, 
the Los Angeles Aqueduct supplies a portion of the water needed to supply the residents and businesses in its 465 square mile service area. The Los Angeles Aqueduct Systems brings water 338 miles from the Mono Basin, Mono Basin, I think it's Mono Basin, and 233 miles from the Owens Valley by gravity to Los Angeles. Just think about that for a second. It brings water from 338 miles away and 233 miles away to Los Angeles. So let's now look up Mono Basin map to see where the Mono Basin is. Because that's amazing. It's going all the way from Mono Basin to Southern California. Not seeing it. Let's try a state map. And eh, not really seeing anything too helpful here. Let's try let's try Google Maps. I I do want to figure out where this is because that's incredible. It's going that distance all the way to Los Angeles. So Mono Basin. Let's see where we end up. All right, we're zoomed in right here. Five star reviews. That's great. Oh wow, that is very far away. So it's up north of Mammoth to the east of Yosemite National Park. And then they're bringing that all the way down to Los Angeles. That's pretty incredible when you really think about it. Water from there is going all the way there. That is, yeah, that's that's a testament to some of some human ingenuity. So now let's check out Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct. The Hetch Hetchy water system delivers about 265,000 acre feet of pristine Sierra Nevada water per year to 2.4 million people in San Francisco, Santa Clara, Alameda, and San Mateo counties. 85% of the water comes from Sierra Nevada snowmelt stored in the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir situated on the Tuolumne River in Yosemite National Park. Hetch Hetchy water travels 160 miles via gravity from Yosemite to the San Francisco Bay Area. That's pretty incredible. So that sounds like it's pretty close to Mono Basin. We we're just looking at Mono Basin. That was just to the east of Yosemite. And it sounds like Hetch Hetchy Reservoir is situated on the Tuolumne River in Yosemite National Park. And then that is filtered and, and supplies 2.4 million people around the Bay Area with water. Pretty incredible. And 85% of the water comes from Sierra Nevada snowmelt. So that's, that's where some good news comes in. We've had a great snow year, so Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct is going to be, I'd imagine, full to the brim. Uh, here's the one I can't pronounce. Mokalumni Aqueduct, the East Bay Municipal Utility District, draws water from the Mokalumni River and transport it transports it 91 miles from the Sierra Nevada through three steel pipeline aqueducts to serve its customers in the East Bay area. The Mokalumni Aqueduct provides 90% of the water served by East Bay Municipal Utilities District. Colorado River, this is going to be an interesting one. Just because we saw the map of where the Colorado River is, it's not really even in California. It's just on the border of California, the very southeastern parts of the state. And it starts all the way in Colorado but then we end up using it for California water. So Colorado River, spanning 1,440 miles from Wyoming to the Gulf of California, the Colorado River is the principal water resource for California and six other states. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Indian tribes and parts of Mexico. The Colorado River supplies urban areas through the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the region's water wholesaler. Farmers in the Imperial, Palo Verde, and Coachella Valleys also rely on the Colorado River. So one river is the principal water resource for California and six other, other states. It's interesting they say principal water resource for California. That almost makes it seem like the majority of the water California uses comes from the Colorado River. 
I, I'm skeptical to believe that, but yeah, maybe their wording wasn't right there, but I'll, also maybe that is true. So Central Valley Project, as California's largest water supplier, the Central Valley Project delivers on average over 7 million acre feet of water per year. CVP water is used to irrigate 3 million acres of farmland in the San Joaquin Valley, as well as provide water for urban use in Contra Costa, Santa Clara, and Sacramento counties. The State Water Project, the largest state-built water and power project in the United States, the SWP spans 600 miles from Northern California to Southern California, providing drinking water for 23 million people and irrigation water for 750,000 acres of farmland. So, state water project, largest state-built water project, and power, providing drinking water for 23 million people. So that's also what's somewhat cool about all these water projects is you get two birds with one stone. You not only bring in water to where you need it, but you also generate energy. And I'd, I'd like to know the answer to this. How much of California's energy comes from hydropower? So hydropower averages 15% of California's electricity generation from 7% in dry years to over 20% in wet years. So I bet this year we're at 25%. It's been an amazing year in terms of rain and snow in some ways. Good for the drought, good for wildfire, good for water supply. Not good in terms of flooding. Uh, nice short one. I needed that after that last section. That last section was pretty long. With that being said, another sip of water. All right, where does your water come from? The answer depends on where you live. Some areas have abundant local sources. For example, the water that I just drank, we learned actually comes from groundwater in the central coast. Some areas have abundant local sources, while other areas rely on imported water for most or even all of their water. I also wonder if I misread that earlier, where it said like 85% of, it might have been Central Valley's water comes from groundwater as opposed to Central Coast, but I'm just so used to seeing Central Coast I filled that in because then I, I was skeptical of that fact. Because I, I know we have a lot of reservoirs around the Central Coast, and I imagine a lot of our drinking water comes from that. So I'm just going to start this section over. The answer depends on where you live. Some areas have abundant local sources, while other areas rely on in, imported water for most or even all of their water. When you turn on a faucet to draw a glass of water, you may be tapping a source close to home or one hundreds of miles away. Find out where your water comes from by clicking here. Let's try it out. Where does my water come from? So, we have our different areas there. Um, so, you, the, I have the link in the description to this. And let's try South Bay. And I want to just see, yeah, I'll try hometown, Capitola. Water sources, groundwater, about 30% of California's total annual water supply comes from groundwater in normal years, 60% in drought years. Wow, this is a pretty cool resource. So just to show you what I did here, just in case you want to see where your drinking water comes from, so you go to the link in the description, come down to this section, where does your water come from, click here, and then on the left, you can click into your regions, it shows the regions on the map, and then within those regions, you can click the different cities to see exactly where your water comes from. I've, I'm a big fan of good graphics, and those are some great graphics there. All right, so now for the importance of agriculture. And this, this will be a good section for me to read. Looks like a long one, but we're, we're looking for information. California has been the nation's leading agricultural and dairy state for more than 50 years. The state's 80,500 farms and ranches produce more than 350 agricultural products. These products generated a 50 billion generated 50 billion in sales value in 2019. 
more than a third of the country's vegetables and two thirds of the country's fruits and nuts are grown in California. That's pretty amazing. A third of the country's vegetables comes from California and two thirds of our fruits and nuts come from just California. That's, that's surprising. But it also makes sense because we're irrigating all of this water, we're bringing it in, we're irrigating, what did it say, 80,000 farms? Pretty incredible. And then there's, there's a reason agriculture is a big priority in California, and that's because we're feeding a large, I shouldn't say we, I'm, I'm not doing anything. Uh, the farmers and ranchers out there are feeding the large majority of the United States. So the state's top 10 agricultural products are milk at 7 billion, almonds at 6 billion. And I have heard there's some debate over almonds because they take so much water to grow. Grapes at 5 billion, cattle and calves at 3 billion, strawberries 2 billion. I think a lot of those are grown in Monterey County. Pistachios at 2 billion, lettuce 2 billion. Also, that's actually, if you don't know, I, I'm a broadcast meteorologist at KSBW. And SBW stands for Salad Bowl of the World, which is the nickname for Salinas because it grows such a large portion of the lettuce that the country eats. Just a little fun fact there. Walnuts, 1.29 billion. Floriculture, don't even know what that is, 1.22 billion. And tomatoes, 1.17 billion, according to 2019 California Department of Food and Agriculture Statistics. So the biggest one, let's see, biggest one's milk. Number two comes in almonds. Bronze goes to grapes. I wonder if they're including wine with grapes. I'd imagine so, because wine's definitely big up in Napa County. So, and Sonoma, and other places as well. Besides California touting the largest agricultural, agricultural economy in the nation, Nine of the nation's top 10 agricultural counties are within state boundaries. Hmm. Fresno County is the most productive agricultural county in the nation, producing more than 350 crops worth a total value of more than 7.7 .7 billion. So while milk was the number one crop, it looks like Fresno is the number one county in terms of crops produced and value produced at $7.7 .7 billion. That's almost a number so big, I, I can't even really picture it. Continuing here, California ha also continues to be the top exporter of agricultural products in the United States, according to the USDA's Economic Research Service. The state exports the greatest amount and range, amount and range of vegetables, fruits, and nuts. Makes sense that our exports are huge. If a third of the country's vegetables come from California and two thirds of our fruits and nuts come from California. The agricultural sector is one of the largest industry sectors in California. Probably a big part of the reason where the, earlier in this course it said we're the number eight economy in the world, but I've heard we're the number five. And then, yeah, I'm seeing some of the comments coming in here. Almonds are expensive, more per pound than most bean. Yeah. I, Almonds are a little out of my budget range right now. I'll, I'll occasionally spurge, splurge and get some cashews, which are still so pretty pricey. But yeah, I think it's because it takes so much water to grow almonds that, that that's what makes it as expensive as they are. It's amazing almond milk is even profitable. And that actually reminds me of a... I'm going to highlight this so we remember where we are. But I wanted to look up how many gallons of water to produce a gallon of almond milk. One of my friends told me this the other day and I didn't believe him. Okay, yeah, my friend was wrong. He said it took something like 50 gallons of water to make one gallon of almond milk. Looks like it's more like 4.5. So I'm gonna tell my friend he was wrong. So, the agricultural sector is one of the largest sectors in California. We already read that. Oh, no, we didn't. Uh, the California agricultural sector is one of the largest industry sectors in California, and its performance is vital to the economic health of the state. Notes, 
the California Employment Development Department. California farms employ between 500,000 to 800,000 workers each year. That's about one third of the country's total workforce of farm workers. Interesting. So, one third of the country's farm workers is able to make one third of our vegetables and two thirds of our fruits and nuts. Sounds pretty productive. Reports indicate about 77% of the workers are male. More than half are between the ages of 25 and 44. I'd imagine that's an industry you want to be young in. I, it sounds like pretty hard work. 18% are under the age of 25, and 26% are between the ages of 45 and 64. The vast majority, 92% of farm workers in California are Latino, and about 75% of California's farm workers are undocumented. That's a pretty wild st statistic right there as well. Huh. So, let's see if we can do the math on that. One third of the country's total workforce is farm workers. Oh, in California, it's 500 to 800,000 workers. That's a third of the country's total workforce. 75, 92% are Latino, 75% are undocumented, and they're producing a third of our vegetables, two thirds of our fruits and nuts. I think that one third vegetables, two thirds fruits and nuts. I've I've said it said it a number of times, so I think that might be the fact that I'm most surprised by at this point. So, reading more about farm workers again, the link is in the description to this course that we're going through. So if you want to click all the different links, you could probably spend a week going through this entire thing. Despite its and maybe I will, despite its. Ec economic importance, the agriculture industry has lost an average of 30,000 acres annually to non-agricultural uses during the past 30 years, according to California Climate and Agricultural Network. That's pretty alarming. We've lost 30,000 acres, says, per year of agri agricultural land to non-agricultural land. The availability of water is crucial to the success of the state's agricultural industry. Good news, we got a lot of rain and snow this year, especially because California is semi-arid in general, and much of the agricultural cropland is in areas where surface water must be pumped and groundwater has been historically depleted. But some of that loss also is attributed to urban growth as cities annex outlying farmlands for commercial slash industrial and residential developments. That was kind of a depressing paragraph. The challenge is providing agriculture an adequate supply given the competition from urban users and providing for environmental needs and also the complications and reduced availability due to seasonal droughts and climate change. That's big part of the reason that I'm learning about California water right now. It is a very complex issue. And I think as a broadcast meteorologist in California, it should definitely be something I know more about. But as well, it's, I would say it's maybe important for everybody to know about in California. The more you know, maybe the shorter showers you'll take, although that might not make a big difference on the grand scheme of things. Individual effort, collectively, can often lead to some great progress. Today's farmers have become adept at water use efficiency. Oh, I have a cool story to tell after this paragraph. As a result, as a result, they produce nearly twice as much food as they did four decades ago, with only 10% more water, according to the CDFA. That might be my new favorite fact of this. The farmers produce twice as much food as they did only 40 years ago. That's not that long in the grand scheme of things, with only 10% more water. That's pretty amazing right there. And the story I was going to tell is, as a broadcast meteorologist, on very rare occasions, I'll go do stories in the field. And I did get to interview a farmer in Hollister one day. And I was blown away at the system that he had for his crops. It was He had all the crops covered by this black, it almost looked like plastic, to trap more heat and moisture in. Then it was drip irrigation. So it was going directly to the plant. 
very little of it was evaporating. And then he would fly drones. I don't know if he would do it or if somebody else would, but they'd fly drones and it would be able to image the leaves of the plants in a certain way where they could see which plants were getting more water than was necessary and which plants were deprived of water. And they were able to change it like in real time to alter their water system so that not a drop of water was being wasted. It was unbelievable. He almost reminded me of a chess player, but he was doing it with crops instead of chess pieces. And then we already read, oh, we didn't read this. So this show, it breaks it down by county. Number one, Fresno County, they are almonds, pistachios, livestock, grapes. I'm at, we also learned they have 350 different types of crops, but it sounds like these are the biggest ones. So a few, a lot of our counties, their number one crop is almonds. Let's see how many, how many, how many, how many counties have their number one crop is almonds. We've got Fresno, Kern, Stanislaus, San Joaquin, and Madera. And then a lot of the counties that weren't number one for almonds are number two, like Merced. And then how about Monterey? We got strawberries, lettuce, broccoli, and grapes. Clicking into the next section, let's read about the water and energy connection. So this is something we started to look into earlier. We learned on average 15% of our water comes from hydropower, but then it varies depending on how much rain you've picked up that year. Water and energy are interconnected. A frequent term to describe this relationship is the water G water water G. That's what it should be called. Water energy nexus. Energy for water. Conveying large quantities of water. Conveying? Huh. Large quantities of water over long distances and over hills and mountain rain mountains is energy intensive. In addition, once it reaches its destination, more energy is needed to treat and pump water for residential, industrial, and agricultural uses. Yeah, we, we looked at that one map of where Mono Basin is, which is the main supplier for Los Angeles, and it was 300 miles away. I do believe some of our water, or a large portion of our water, is transported via gravity, but you imagine there's hills and stuff. So in those cases, you do need energy to transport it. Water distribution systems use energy for pumping and pressurization. Consumers and businesses use energy to treat water with softeners or filters. Energy is needed to heat and cool water as well as to circulate it with pumps. In addition, treatment plants use energy to pump and treat wastewater and process solids. Nothing too exciting there. Statewide, these processes consume 20% of the state's total electricity. That's pretty interesting. 30% of the state's natural gas, and 88 million gallons of diesel fuel, according to the California Energy Commission. Wow. So, our water processes, interesting. So, what I was reading about, I only looked up what percent of our energy comes from water in hydropower. It sounds like it's 15%. But then in Water in general, it takes 20% of the state's electricity, 30% of our natural gas, and 88 million gallons of diesel fuel. Again, for good reason though, considering we're producing, <laughs> we're, considering the farmers are producing a large portion of the entire country's food. Water for energy. Some of this energy can be recaptured by sending water down through turbines to generate hydroelectricity. An average of 18 gallons of fresh water is needed to generate one kilowatt hour of electricity at hydroelectric plants, according to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, a US Department of Energy laboratory in Colorado. Electric energy is typically measured in kilowatt hours. Kilowatt is 1000 watts. For example, <laughs> I was hoping they would give an example because when I read 18 gallons of fresh water is needed to generate one kilowatt of electricity, I can imagine 18 gallons of fresh water, but I have no idea what a kilowatt of electricity means. So for example, 
A 60 watt light bulb that operates for 100 hours uses 6 kilowatts. So, if we do a little math there, I, they might do the math for us. In terms of the water and energy nexus, for example, wastewater treatment in California uses 500 to 1500 kilowatt hours per acre foot, according to the Environmental Protection Agency. Yeah, let's try our own math. So, 18 gallons of fresh water to generate one kilowatt hour of electricity, and then for a light bulb to operate for 100 hours, it takes six kilowatt hours. So times six, that would take 108 gallons of water to operate a light bulb for 100 hours. That's, that does not seem that great, to be honest. But if it is hydroelectric, I wonder if you can just keep generating energy from the same water. It's not like it's wasted. It flips the turbine and then the water goes on its way. So it's, yeah, it's not like the you use 18 gallons of fresh water and then make the electricity and that water is wasted. You most likely are still going to be using that water for something else. So thanks to energy generated at hydroelectric plants along their routes, this Central Valley Project, I believe that's what the acronym was, Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct and the Los Angeles Aqueduct are all net producers of energy, meaning they produce more energy than they consume to convey water. That's pretty interesting. That, that's finally something that we've read about that's sustainable. So... However, the State Water Project and the Colorado River Aqueduct, the two main systems that bring water into Southern California, are net users of energy, meaning they use more energy than the amount generated by hydroelectric plants along their routes. Interesting. So, you're transporting water, you run it through turbines, you generate electricity, so you're not only getting water, but you're getting electricity. In for the CVP, Hetch Hetchy, and Los Angeles Aqueduct, that's a net positive. For the Colorado River, energy-wise, it's a negative. But overall-wise, it must be a positive because we keep doing it in terms of bringing the water to SoCal. Pumping one acre foot of Colorado River Aqueduct water to Southern California consumes 2,000 kilowatt hours. Yet the State Water Project is the largest single user of energy in California. Pumping one acre foot of State Water Project water to Southern California requires 3,000 kilowatt hours. That's an average of 5 billion kilowatt hours per year, the equivalent of about 2 to 3 percent of all electric electricity consumed in California. Just gonna think about that for a second. So the State Water Project is the largest single user of energy in California. I guess that makes sense, considering water, you could argue, is our most important resource, and we're certainly doing a lot with it. I'm going to take a quick sip of water. <clears throat> the issue is this. Oh, we're going to get a little controversial here. The State Water Project pumps water 700 miles from the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta to Southern California, and two-thirds of California's population, 70% of State Water Project goes to urban users and 30% to agriculture. This path includes up nearly 2,000 feet over the Tehachapi Mountains. Definitely said that wrong, but wow. So... That makes sense that it takes so much energy if you're taking a large amount of water, 700 miles, and lifting it up over 2,000 feet of elevation. To put the amount of energy used to convey water into perspective, always like that, an average Californian household uses 573 kilowatt hours of electricity a month, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration and statewide per capita use of water is 196 gallons per day. According to DWR, about 892 gallons per day equals one acre foot. 
So providing a Southern California household with the amount of state water project water it needs for four and a half days takes the same amount of electricity that household uses during five months. Whoa. All right, that might be the new craziest fact that we've learned so far. I'm just going to say it again. Providing a Southern California household with the amount of state water project water it needs for four and a half days takes the same amount of electricity that household uses during five months. That is wild. So what might be done to reduce the amount of energy used? One solution is water conservation by end users. residential, businesses, industrial, and agricultural. By reducing the amount of water used, the demand lessens on the energy-intensive systems that deliver and treat water. That was pretty crazy right there. And for more information, you can click these links. Now let's check out the Delta. Got some good information here, nice green picture. That's what a lot of the hills look like in California right now. Love how green it is out there. So early on in the 1800s, key crops of, wait, what's this section called again? Oh, glad I scrolled back up. I skipped something. The Delta, the hub and critical link of California's water system. So looks like that's what the Delta is that we're referring to here. Click here to see an interactive map of the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. It looks like it comes out into San Francisco Bay. The Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta is California's most crucial water and ecological resource. Nearly two-thirds of the state's population and millions of acres of farmland receive their water from the region where Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers converge. So you have Sacramento River coming in, San Joaquin River coming in, those converge, turn into the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, and nearly two-thirds of the state's population and millions of acres of farmland receive their water from this delta. Writing gets a little weird here. We're over here on the right side. The river's combined fresh water flows, flows, <laughs> let me try this again. The river's combined fresh water flows roll through the Carquinas Strait, a narrow break in the coast range, and into San Francisco Bay's northern arm, forming the San Francisco Bay, Sacramento, San Joaquin, Delta Estuary, commonly referred to as the Bay Delta. The mixture of fresh waters from the five rivers which feed into the delta combine, combine with the salty ocean water to create the largest estuary on the west coast of North America, covering more than 40% of California, more than 738,000 acres in five counties. Hmm. That's pretty crazy. It's the, what was that largest estuary on the west coast of North America? Most of the delta, 500,000 plus acres, is agricultural. The delta produces more than 500 million of agricultural products annually. It was the first developed ag region in California thanks to flat land, fertile soil, and ample water supply. Very interesting stuff there. Early on in the 1800s, key crops of pears and asparagus were transported from Sacramento to San Francisco via steamboats. Today, hundreds of crops are grown in the Delta. <laughs> Voice is starting to give out. Luckily, we're, it looks like we're getting to the end of the course here pretty soon. Today, hundreds of crops are grown in the Delta. The top 10 in acres, oh, it looks like this report, no, if it's connected, looks, I just got a notification that says live stream reconnected successfully. Maybe the Wi-Fi went out for a quick second there, but hopefully we're back. So we're just reading some of the top crops in the Delta. Got corn, wheat, tomato, asparagus, rice, alfalfa, grapes, safflower, almond, and oat. Most recently, the number of acres planted in wine grapes has increased to 85,000. I was wondering where wine came into all of this. That's the first time it's mentioned it. While some Delta vineyards date back to the 1800s, newer vineyards thrive in the fertile soil. The Delta produces about 25% of the state's wine grapes, which are exported to other regions and also used by local winemakers. 
So just to refresh, again, we're learning about the delta as part of our California Water 101 course. And it's the delta is shown right here. And it is considered California's most crucial water and ecological resource. And that, that's a pretty big statement right there. Chardonnay, <laughs> it's because we love our wine. Chardonnay is the most widely planted variety with 19,000 reported acres. Zinfandel is a second at 19,494 acres. All right. So Chardonnay was I estimated there, but it rounded up to 20,000. The Delta also is a significant estuary, a delicate environment where the fresh water from the inland rivers mixes with ocean water from the San Francisco Bay. It's the largest freshwater tidal estuary on the west coast of North and South America. Oh wow, earlier they just said North America, but seems like it's entire North and South America, which I'm pretty sure they could just say our continent, right? I believe that's right. The diverse ecosystem supports 750 different species of plants, fish, and animals. An estimated 80% of the state's commercial fishery species live in or migrate through the delta, and millions of migratory waterfowl rely on region's wetland as they travel the Pacific Flyway from South America to Alaska. So I would imagine this is where a lot of the balance between agriculture urban and environment comes in because that paragraph right there is pretty amazing the delta it it also makes sense why they said they started out this section by saying california's most crucial water and ecological resource we've not only been reading about how many crops that it produces but it also supports 750 different species of plants fish and animals and an estimated 80% of the state's commercial fishery species live in or migrate through the delta. That's, pr and you have millions of migratory waterfowl as well. So, unbelievable. And that's where you have the balance of priorities when it comes to California water, and personally, I would say for good reason. The delta also is a regional playground with 290 shoreline recreation areas, 200 marinas with 12,000 in-water boat slips, 635 miles of boating waterways, and 61,000 acres of open water. The Delta draws nearly 7 million visitors a year. This is starting to sound like a travel brochure, but again, California is pretty awesome. That's, that's why I'm never leaving. And it's also why I'm motivated to learn about our problems, including California water, which again, not only a problem, it's also our most valuable resource, you could say. Activities such as fishing, boating, water skiing, windsurfing, sightseeing, birding, biking, and camping generate about one billion annually in economic activity and support about 8,000 jobs, according to a state analysis. That's, that's pretty incredible. The Delta is important. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's a understatement. Everyone in, and it's funny that I didn't really even know what the Delta was before I started this live stream. That's why I'm doing this. It's because learn about things that are important, as important as the Delta. Everyone in California depends upon the Delta for something. So this is going to break down the most important things the Delta does. And just, I love bullet points. It makes it way easier to read and understand. Drinking water. The Delta provides a portion of the drinking water for 27 million Californians. Fresh produce, 45% of fruits and vegetables grown in the U.S. are irrigated with Delta water. That's crazy. Fish, 80%. I'm sure people are tired of me saying that's crazy, but we've come across some wild facts throughout the course of this course. Fish, 80% of the state's commercial fish pass through the Delta. Irrigation for agriculture, the Delta provides water for 4.5 million acres of the state's 36 billion agricultural industry with irrigation. Wildlife also depends on the Delta as it provides crucial year-round habitat as well as an important stop for migratory birds. So I think I skipped across that one bullet point just because big numbers are always hard to imagine, but 4.5 million acres is a lot. 36 billion agricultural industry with irrigation is a lot as well. Uh-oh, here's where the bad news comes in. 
However, the Delta is failing in health. Major issues include subsidence, native species decline, fragile levee system, and potential earthquake risk. So does, it does get into a little bit more here. In recent years, populations of native fish species in the Delta have plummeted. The population of the once abundant Delta smelt, that's the, I think, fifth or sixth time I've heard about the Delta smelt in the last couple of days, so it must be pretty important, has seen a rapid decline and recent trawl surveys have found no smelt. The Delta smelt is considered an indicator of the biological health of the Delta, and its population has dropped so precipitously that some scientists fear they are on the brink of extinction. Other species, such as the Chinook salmon, are threatened as well. That's not good. Massive pumps at the southern end of the marsh pull about 5.5 million acre feet per year of freshwater from the waterways to feed both the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. However, these pumps entrain significant amounts of fish, and these pumps have been the subject of a lawsuit. There's some Delta levees. All right. Oh, wow. It goes into the Delta a lot here. I'm going to take another sip, prepare for this next section. Alrighty, besides being the hub of California's water supply, the Delta is a, is a vital farming region with complex infrastructure connecting the Bay Area to the Central Valley. More than 500,000 people live on farms and in 14 cities and towns in five counties. Infrastructure includes five highways, three railroad lines, two deep water shipping channels, hundreds of natural gas lines, and five high voltage transmission lines. The Delta also has more than a half a million acres of productive farmland. All of this property and infrastructure is protected by an extensive network of levees. In total, there are at least 1,100 miles of levees that protect the Delta and channel water through the area. Many of these were built soon after the California Gold Rush. Oh, so they've been they've been around a while. Since 1850, 95% of the estuary's wetlands and tidal marshes have been levied and filled with a resulting loss of fish and wildlife habitat. There is some concern that these older levees could fail. And I don't know if the levee that just broke in Pajaro is part of the Delta levee system, but that, that was one of the biggest stories that we've had this year along the Central Coast, and it's actually a story that we're still talking about to this day. We had... An atmospheric river event, it wasn't even that much rainfall, but then the levee broke, so then all of this water filtered into the city of Pajaro. I think it displaced 3,000 people. They're, they picked up 2 million pounds of trash yesterday. It's just widespread de devastation in that community, and it's, it's a pretty rough time for the people of Pajaro to this day. So if you are interested in that, I know we've done a lot of stories on it. KSBW, you can check out the KSBW YouTube page to see some of those. And then I'm sure there are some ways that you could donate to help out with that because there's a there's a lot of people hurting right now and a lot of them are the farm workers that we've been reading about that have used a lot of this California water to produce the majority of the country's food. Much of the network of levities through the Delta has been built only to 100-year flood standards. By contrast, the levees in New Orleans were built to 250-year standards when Hurricane Katrina hit. Levees are susceptible to failure by erosion, seepage, rising sea levels, earthquakes, and land subsidence. In California, levees have failed 162 times in the past 100 years. So the basic summary there is, sounds like some of these levees were built when the gold rush was happening, and because of that, they... The entropy is just the law of the universe, so they're going to degrade over time, and then when they fail, it leads to some flooding like what we're seeing in Pajaro right now. The flooding is done, but now the recovery efforts are underway. If a critical levee failure occurred, salt water would flow, flood many Delta Islands, potentially disrupting water deliveries to Southern and Central California. Water users would be forced, would be forced users 
to, I think that's wrong grammar, water users would be forced to rely on stored supplies. It could take several years and billions of dollars for the water system to be restored if a major, major levee break occurred. So that's another one of those sections that, not, a, not great news there. I, I don't have the answers for you. The controversy, statewide water reliability depends on getting water south and west of the Delta to cities, farms, and other uses. For better than 20 years, the Delta has been embroiled in continued controversy about the struggle to restore the faltering ecosystem while maintaining its role as the hub of the state's water supply. So here we see working towards a solution. Just continue right on to the next section. There are compounding issues to be addressed. A five-year drought, not anymore, we're, we're looking in the clear at this point, and limited water availability have had impacts to how much water is released through the system the State Water Project, and the Central Valley Project. In addition, a court order regarding the decline of the endangered Delta smelt has restricted how much water can be pumped from the Delta. So this is where some of the California controversy comes in when, in terms of our water. The Delta Stewardship Council was formed in 2009 to develop a Delta plan to be used to guide state and local actions in the Delta in a manner that furthers the co-equal goals of Delta restoration and water supply reliability. So trying to figure out what the solutions are and the answers are to some of the problems that we've been reading about. The council developed the Delta plan, which aims to recover endangered species, reduce pollution, reduce invasive species, rebuild salmon runs, and enhance habitat for wildlife in six high priority locations in the Delta and, ooh, Suisun Marsh. Hopefully I said that right. Other recommendations include improve water efficiency, development of other local water supplies, improve maintenance of Delta levees, more storage, protection of Delta farmlands and communities. So California water fix. The Water fix planning process began in 2006, initially proposed at the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, a permitting process for long-term project permits for the Delta. The BDCP aimed to separate the water delivery system from Delta freshwater flows and restore thousands of acres of habitat, restore river flows to more natural patterns, and address issues affecting the health of fish populations. So we read earlier, smelt might be extinct at this point, Eh, not, maybe not yet, but these are some of the answers to try to solve those problems and keep more, more, keep it from keep more populations of fish or animals from following the same fate. State and federal federal agencies proposed updating the SWP by adding two points of diversion in the North Delta. In July 2015, the California Department of Water Resources and Bureau of Reclamation identified water fix as the preferred alternative replacing the BDCP. The $15 billion plan focused on the construction of two large four-story tall tunnels to carry fresh water from the Sacramento River under the delta toward the intake stations for the SWP and CVP. An additional $8 billion would be devoted to habitat restoration. That sounds like quite a project there. In 2019, California Water Fix was withdrawn. Currently, the Delta Water Conveyance Plan is to construct a single tunnel that would reroute water around the Delta straight to the export pumps. And again, I don't exactly know when this course was written, so I don't know what the latest updates on these things are, but uh, I'm sure there's lots of information online. So, the tunnel proposal has its supporters and critics. Proponents say the tunnel would. So this maybe ties in also to what I was saying earlier about how a tunnel seems like it would be a good idea because... Ugh, oh, one sec, just stretching and yawning. <laughs> or running out of steam. Um, a tunnel does seem like it'd be a good idea because then you wouldn't have as much evaporation as you're transporting the water. So proponents say it would benefit fish taking water directly from the river 40 miles away from existing pumps 
Tunnels would bypass the existing screens that fail to prevent fish from dying in the pumps. Provide increased reliability, if levees fail during a natural disaster, the tunnels could still provide fresh water to the pumps and into the state and federal water delivery systems. Seems like pretty important points to make right there. All right, now opponents. Ooh, the opponents say it's actually going to harm the fish. So proponents say benefit fish. Opponents say harm fish. The endangered delta smelt may benefit from the tunnels, but many biologists say the altered flows would doom the endangered Chinook salmon and steelhead that spawn in the Sacramento River. Ooh, I don't really know what a smelt is, but I know salmon is... I was about to say delicious, but I don't I don't know if that's the angle I want to take on this. Salmon are a very important resource, and it sounds like the tunnel would harm the salmon. Improving the Delta pumps 40-year-old fish screens instead would cost no more than $2 billion. Huh. So it seems like it's the cheaper route as well. Not provide increased reliability. There's no way to safeguard the main aqueducts that transgress major fault lines that deliver water southward. You can read more there. And how about the increased flow proposal? Looks like we're getting to the end. Almost there. In September 2016, the California State Water Resources Control Board, State Water Board, released a revision of freshwater standards last updated since 1996. You can read about the plan here. The plan proposes to provide a minimum flow standard of 30 to 50% of the unimpaired natural runoff from the Stanislaus, Merced, and Tuolumne rivers to be sent down the lower San Joaquin River and into the Delta. Again, there are viewpoints on both sides of the proposal. I always like when, when we're given both sides of a proposal. So you get a little bit more nuance in it feels a bit more like here's the pros here's the cons you make up your own mind about what you think instead of just putting forward one side so with that being said let's go pro first scientific studies <clears throat> have shown that flow is a major factor in the survival of fish such as salmon steelhead sturgeon and smelt con result in a 14 percent reduction in surface water to the region Increased groundwater pumping, ooh, by 105,000 acre feet a year, and increase unmet agricultural water demand by at least 69,000 acre feet a year. Ooh, interesting. I want to read those again. So, pro flow is a major factor in the survival of fish such as salmon, steelhead, sturgeon, and smell. Con. So increased groundwater pumping by over 100,000 acre feet a year. That's, that's a pretty big con right there because we're already depleting our groundwater at, at an unsustainable rate. But then again, fish, very important. And they live here too. So yeah, I, I don't know the answers to that one. I think, uh, think more research would be needed before I could really draw a conclusion on that. And then looks like another con, decrease the region's economic output by 64 million. And finally, a balance of a question of balance and sustainability. And this will probably be a good wrap-up conclusion here. Water is a limited resource. There's only so much of it to go around. Managing California's finite water supply in the future so that it is sustainable and reliable will require striking a balance between the three stakeholders: urban users, agricultural users, and the environment. As the state continues to grow, it's going to require rethinking in how we view and use water throughout the state. And we're all going to have to be more efficient in how we use it. I think that was a perfect little conclusion right there. And I certainly learned a lot about California water throughout this course. I'm probably going to need to sleep and to really let all of the information that we've picked up sink in, but overall, it seems like California water sounds like it's our most important resource. It is incredibly important to our environment, fish species, birds, just beauty, recreation. It's also important to urban use, obviously. There's a lot of people who live in California. We need to drink waters. It's 
advisable that we take showers and it's also recreation. People love golf, not activities that take up things like water. And then agriculture is also a massive part of California water. We produce a large majority of the nation's food, or I shouldn't say large majority. It's one third of our vegetables, two thirds of our fruits and nuts, and lots of good wine as well. So yeah, California water, very important. Right now it does sound like we're still depleting our groundwater unsustainably. That's most likely a big problem that we're probably going to have to address in my lifetime. But that's part of the reason that I'm diving into this. Hopefully you found it interesting as well. And for anybody who made it through this entire California Water 101 course, I'm glad that we all know a little bit more about the water and the great state that we live in. Thanks for watching.